Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, Abir's Book Reviews, and today I will be reviewing this book, A Nation of Idiots by Daksh Tyagi. This is a pretty good book in my opinion, and since it is a little bit on the political side and, uh, you know, <coughs> explaining a lot of things, I decided to take notes as I went along. So those will be the reference points for this review, so let's get started. So the book starts off with an introduction of the book. The author starts this book by sharing uh, a personal anecdote and the story of the demonetization of Indian currency carried out by the BJP government in 2016. Here he defines a nation of idiots as being, and I quote, a collective of heads that influences our lives for the worse, a group that forces their logic, their reasons, and their way of life. You can be in it, move in and out of it, and yet be unaware that it exists. The author then goes on to the story of demonetization and shares a few statistics of how the Indian population reacted to this sudden change. And with these changes, along came rumors, as is expected. Daksh then shares some ways in which people with a lot of black money tried to outsmart the government. One man bought six months' worth of train tickets through cash and urged his close friends and family to do the same with his money, saying that they would ask for a refund once the crisis was over. But a lot of people ended up copying this idea and the government caught on, leading the man to lose all the money. Another was a man who, uh, who was close to a bank manager and used backdoor access to turn in his black money. He also told his friends and family of the quick access he had and that for a 20% cut, he could also exchange their black money. Once again, the government caught on and the operation failed. Lastly, a man purchased gold with his black money. Seeing that a lot of people did this, the government put a cap on the amount of gold a single person can hold. Since no vendor was willing to buy back uh, the black gold, he had to sell it for a loss of 16 lakh rupees. And this is the story of the nation of idiots. Daksh explains that the government doesn't look into each and every person's backdoor shenanigans. But when a queue is formed where it shouldn't, such as when the person spreads the word about what he's doing and how he can help, help others do the same, the government takes notice. He says that people don't get away with cheating the government. The government just doesn't actively look for it. But when a queue forms behind you, they will come after you. He says, sure, a few hundred people died from standing in ATM lines and such, but thousands would die later from cold winters. We did nothing for the ones in need. We just walked out with our old notes, the same old idiots. And instead of storing that black money in a cupboard, we could have helped homeless people survive with these notes. And this is the real menace of a nation of idiots. Its member count increases exponentially, and all of them are revealed at once, and in no time, there are millions enlisted. The next section talks about an ideal Indian man. So the author says that there are two main things which define an ideal Indian man. His hatred of Pakistan and the desire to be first. And Indians aim to find quality in absurd quantities. He then goes on to explain the qualities of an Indian man through anecdotes, as he does quite often in this book. So first is conformity. The author says that since childhood, he had been told what a good boy should do. He would love cricket, drink his glass of milk, hate Pakistan, sleep at time. And you should be kind, but hate Pakistan. And a boy shouldn't fight unless it's with Pakistanis. The author then shares an incident where a friend's family was having a prayer or a ritual of sorts, which he decided to join. Firstly, he was introduced to the person who would be conducting the prayer, and as we Indian call it, he is a god-man. And the author was baffled. If he is the one who talks uh, directly to God, then why do individuals still need to pray? Why not just contact God directly like he does? And the host family then proceeded to wash the god-man's feet, saying that they were washing away their crimes. Okay, that is acceptable, but when the water used to wash feet was put in silverware and drunk by everyone, the author left. And that's not surprising. That's normal human behavior. 
So the father of the friend tried to uh, explain to the author later on, but even then, it wasn't very convincing. How can the bacteria of an old man's feed be good and safe for consumption? While the same bacteria or someone else's feed is disgusting. The author terms this the good bacteria defense, which had him convinced that the Indian man doesn't understand the scriptures he blindly follows, which puts him in an unfortunate position of trying to defend something which he doesn't himself understand. He must believe and not question, nod and not understand, and he must always carry the good bacteria defense. How else will he conform? The next is a religious attitude. So much like the previous state, this uh, this one is more of an unquestioning attitude towards the religious scriptures. Accept what is written in them and whatever the God men tell you to do. The author makes an important observation at this point. He says that the Indian man would do even the most absurd thing if it is said to be done by a God man. And it's explained through another example so i will not be dwelling into all of the examples just the most relevant ones and in the end the religious attitude that we, uh, most of the indian people carry is the sad and unfortunate reality of how most of them live next is to have a simple understanding of complex systems so the author starts this one with a quote a woman marries away, a man brings a woman into his house. He can do what he wants, and she must do what his family wants. If she does not, he won't want her anymore. This is what the author says Indians call tradition, but it is just a disguised form of chauvinism. The author says that as a child, any doubt he had or any question he raised invariably ended with the word, with the word culture. And he then shares a conversation with his elder sister uh, who was having an argument with a mother of a friend and a very acute point comes up. The mother was asked the question that why don't a married couple break away from the restrictions and live on their own instead of with the man's families and his parents. And to this the mother replied, this is not our culture. You don't just abandon your parents to go live in another house, to which Dux's sister gave an acute reply, unless you are a woman. And in this section, it's basically explained that our culture and traditions revolve heavily around men. And another truth comes up, which is that most of us confuse sanskar or values with sanskriti or culture. And it seems that we won't be able to understand the basic terms of the complex system we are trying to operate. So the last one is uh, to treat Bollywood for, uh, films as sermons to society. Here the author shares another one of his interesting personal stories. He says that when in boarding school the issue came up during a play that Bollywood has made the Indian society more sexist and makes the Indian man view himself as being more important than women. The author, after some research and the promise of a bag of chips, makes a compelling arg argument to his teacher. He said that during our glorious freedom struggle, while leaders have gave speeches against might before right, and women were forced to stay at home. Most women couldn't step outside the home unescorted. Prevalent practices included public shaming, infanticide, dowry, sati, and child marriage. So while India was fighting for freedom, half of the population would... Uh, could not live according to their wishes. And whose freedom were we fighting for exactly? For a nation to be free or just for the Indian man to be free? The author says that the effect of films on our lives is superficial. The Indian society has always been sexist, but Bollywood is just the medium to which we can point. In the end, the author says that the Indian man is given the right to speech, but threatened against exercising it. He is given the freedom to practice his religion, but only if it if he does it the way he is told to. And he is told that he is equal before the law unless the other guy has connections within the system. In the end, an ideal Indian man is unfree. Culture, society, and cults oppress him. He forgets that he can question. 
this section is an amazing uh, this section is an amazing look into what the indian society is really about and the author highlights a lot of the important points without breaking the government and politics into it and this is something which is not common for us to see these days and that is another plus point for this book and why i really enjoyed this the next section is about the state of women and here the author mainly talks about the state of women in india and this he does yet again through stories and through the story he shared the two main reasons that women in indian society are treated as they are firstly because of the social stereotypes and secondly because of the way an indian man is the latter was also discussed in a previous section uh, in the ending part with the entire uh, thing about the indian freedom movement being quite sexist so daksh talks about sex left uh, sex selective abortions in this section and discrimination against the girl child and family pressure he then goes on to explain how women see the country differently as compared to men and that it is one thing to know these struggles and another thing to experience them he also he also shares a story which highlights another point there are several women out there who are blind to the needs and problems of women of other states but they are also very quick to point out the shortcomings of their state and how their personal lives are affected so it's not only that men are blind to women's need some women are too <clears throat> the relation between an indian man and female empowerment has been elaborated as such we are like 13 year olds behind the wheel of a car stuck midway down a slope we don't know how to take it forward so we just keep it from moving it is the only thing we know to keep us safe because we are afraid of where it might lead if we let go and some of us are finding bricks of religion history and precedents to make sure this issue remains halted the broken and disconnected societies keep women apart and only when you experience this do you understand it discussion of women's rights and the lot differ according to the society to which the speaker belongs to the next section is about raising kids <clears throat> the author believes that these school report cards are just booklets that map the behavior of a child the what most indian parents look for in their child report card is a validation of their parenting style everything a child does appears to be a reflection on the parents he says that the indian mind is a very special thing it can identify people through just their full names we can figure out what, uh, that person in a fraction of second instantly we know how to speak to them we know their preferred trade their expertise ambitions traits eating habits festivals and all of that he then goes on to narrate some stories to prove this point he also he also shows that most of the most of the raising of kids is not done by the parents but instead by the society and schools kids have a curious approach to things and would blindly follow any advice given to them by someone they know and trust like a relative or a teacher and when a stereotype is judgment is made by these people it reflects on the children if your surname decides what issues hurt you then is your painting style anything more than molding more of the same the author says that the people are now being put into categories like in a catalog your logic of alliance is skewed your path in life is bracketed and your eyes closing to adopt the ways of an outsider without considering its merit and the last section which i will be talking about in this book is inheritance So the author says that he doesn't like to talk much with people who are constantly speaking of inheritance. He says that such people like the smell of other people's money and it's quite true. An obsession with the monetary inheritance will ruin your days and abandonment of it will nag the nights out of your eyes and discussion on it holds no value. Monetary inheritance though is far from fascinating. The most fascinating thing is our ability to collect and store the ideas of previous generations. 
The author also wonders if the ideas we pass on have any relevance. The author is, uh, is also baffled, and rightfully so, by the traditions and customs passed down from one generation to another. For example, he says that most girls think that even though they are salaried, they must take an allowance from their in-laws for household expenses. Most girls also think that uh, even though they don't have a suitable environment to live with their in-laws, she must not move out because the society might gossip about them and all of that. Then the author shares an incident where he went to a wedding. And in Indian wedding, is it, uh, weddings, it is customary that the bride's side of the family gives some money to every person from the groom's side. But when the author received this money, he thought it best to return it to the bride. But by doing so, uh, by, by doing so he got an angry call from the groom's mother saying that the bride's mother is very upset and thinks that the money wasn't enough. This is again passed down generation to generation through the Indian bloodline. Plato said a lot of great things, and arguably he was the greatest of thinkers, but he also compared women to children. And would the world uh, be if the ones after him just thought it best to go along with him? Uh, we are so hung up on doing things the old way, and we often forgot to question, forget to question if the old ways are even right. Most of us just think it is best to get along. Here the author concludes as such. At what point is a generation free? Free to re-examine their ways of life. Open to embracing tradition, but to discard what makes us miserable. And does this thought matter in a place where traditions are biased? Where the seldom understood is followed like a flight path? Where to question is fast becoming treason? Where what has been going on through the ages carries more merit than examining what must stop. And where to go along is the norm, but to pause and ponder is a problem. What hurts us is most is not what we inherit, but what we fail to shrug off. So that is it for this review, and that is only half the book. So I'll just show you. So far, I have only covered these sections till inheritance and they are still about roughly the same amount left but this video is getting quite long so yeah that's it for the first part of this book review and I would just like to conclude by saying that I feel this book is pretty amazing if you are anyone who lives in India basically if you want to look into how a majority of Indians operate then you should definitely purchase this book and read it other than that uh, there are a few parts where some people might get offended so I just need to point that out it does heavily criticize the Indian traditions and uh, societal norms but if you are someone who is not easily hurt over those things I think you should definitely read this book there it is one more time if you guys enjoyed make sure you hit the like button if you're new and haven't already done so subscribe to the channel to keep receiving more videos like this one i've been abir rao and thanks for watching